Welcome to the London School of Economics. My name is Silvana Tanreiro. I'm a professor of economics and member of the Center for Macroeconomics here at the LSE. I am absolutely delighted to introduce Tim Harford's lecture today. I should say that this uh, event is jointly hosted by the, the LSE Department of Economics and the Center for Macroeconomics. Um, as I'm sure you all know, uh, Tim Harford is a prolific economist, journalist, and broadcaster. He's a senior columnist for the Financial Times, and indeed the face behind the very well-known column, uh, The Undercover Economist, and as well as the, the more recent FT column, Since You Asked. As a broadcaster, Tim has presented television and radio series for the BBC, and is perhaps mostly known for more or less um, pop-up ideas on Radio 4. Tim has won multiple distinctions and awards and is one of the UK's top young public intellectuals today. He is the author of The Undercover Economist, The Logic of Life, Dear Undercover Economist, Adapt, and of course the new book he's presenting today, The Undercover Economist Strikes Back, How to Run or Ruin an Economy. And let me say, just a couple of words um, about the book, which I actually read last night on a 12-hour trip back from Africa. First, this is a book full of great, deep insights about crucial and often complex macroeconomic problems. And at the same time, it's a book that is highly entertaining, written with a lot of humor, playfulness, and themes unmatchable clarity. I can assure you the book will grab your attention and beat to death any jet lag or trip exhaustion. Um, the second thing I'd like to remark is that how to run or ruin an economy is not just relevant for developed countries' crisis, which is in a way the starting motiva motivation for the book, but it's also extremely relevant for developing economies in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. I think it's a fantastic read for anyone interested in macroeconomics regardless of geography and political or ideological background. Um, Tim has been many times at the LSE, so he knows how to run the show. Um, so I leave the floor to him. He'll speak for about 50 minutes. After that, there will be an opportunity to uh, take questions from the audience. And after that, um, he will sign some cop copies of his book. Um, just three practical things. First, please put your mobiles on silent. Uh, second, the talk will be recorded, and we hope that uh, a podcast of the event will be made available online. And finally, for those on Twitter, the hashtag is LSE Harford. Uh, so please join me in, in welcoming Tim with a warm applause. Thank you so much, Silvana. When I decided to write a book about macroeconomics, uh, I thought, where, where should I begin? Where, where is the beating heart of economic thought? And so I decided I would start at the London School of Economics. 1949, to be precise, a seminar uh, organized by Lionel Robbins. And as you probably know, because of course you, you're all deeply aware of the history of the LSE, uh, the Robin Seminars were the, the, the cutting edge of British economic thought in the late 1940s, the early 1950s, because Robbins had set himself the mission of rivaling John Maynard Keynes's Cambridge. Uh, he was recruiting the best, uh, most creative, uh, most authoritative, most controversial economists, um, people like Friedrich von Hayek, um, people who would go on to win Nobel Prizes, uh, like uh, uh, Arthur Lewis or James Mead. And he wanted to gather them all together, now that Keynes was dead, uh, and use them, use their intellect as a launch pad for this, this brand new subject born out of the Depression called macroeconomics. And this particular seminar that I want to talk about, just before Christmas 1949, 
was given to, to all of these, these great economists. And it wasn't given by some hotshot who'd come over from Vienna or from Harvard. Uh, it was given by a mature student, still a young man in his 30s, nervous, chain-smoking. He always had a cigarette on his lips or, or between his fingertips. And he was an academic failure. He hadn't even studied economics properly, and the little he had studied, he, he wasn't doing well. He was studying sociology. He was failing that. And yet somehow he, he'd been invited to give this talk. And all these great professors showed up to see what he had to say because they felt that something extraordinary was going to happen. Quite possibly something extraordinarily weird, embarrassing, and laughable, but certainly something to talk about afterwards. Now, the man who was attracting all the attention uh, was called Alban William Phillips. And Phillips had been born about 35 years pr previously in um, Terahunga in New Zealand. Now, New Zealand, as you may know, is a rural country. Terahunga is the rural part of rural New Zealand. The bill had grown up on a dairy farm. And his father's farm was, was the only one in the neighbourhood to have electric light. It was the only one in the neighbourhood to have a flush toilet. Not because Bill Phillips' father was rich. It was because Bill Phillips' father was a tinkerer. He, he was an engineer, amateur engineer. He loved to, to play with things and figure out how they worked. And once he'd figured out how they worked, to make things and to fix things. And he gave Bill that same sense that the world was his plaything, that you could understand it and you could make things that were worth making and you could fix things when they were broken. And he taught Phil, uh, uh, Bill how to make um, zoetropes, the sort of um, animated toys. You spin them around and you see the sort of the, the flickered animation of a, of a horse jumping over a, an obstacle, something like that. He taught him how to make crystal radios. Bill's mother was a primary school teacher. and She taught him to read. She taught him to love books. And so he, he went out into the world with this love of knowledge, but also this very practical attitude. So he, too, just like his father, he loved to, to make things and he loved to fix things. So the first thing he made, uh, at least on, uh, that I have records of, was a sort of contraption for his bicycle. So Bill had to cycle uh, nine miles to the train station and get the train to go to secondary school and then get the train back and then pick up his bike and then cycle nine miles home. It's a bit, a bit of a faff. And so he came up with this invention. What he was going to do was like a um, piece of uh, a music stand, like a violin stand. So he put this on the front of his bike and then he put his school textbooks or other books on the, on the sort of the stand and he could cycle along and, and read his textbooks as he cycled and save time. Not a total success, has to be said. Um, but then when, a little later, he was still struggling with this problem of how to get to school. And he found out that a neighbour of his had this old truck and was just completely broken down and no one knew how to fix it. And so he got hold of this thing, which was regarded as basically being scrap. And he popped open the hood and, and had a look. And Bill's attitude was, this is a system... Uh, that I can understand. I can figure out what makes this thing work. And I can figure out how to fix it. And that was the task he set himself. He rolled up his sleeves, he worked on it, he understood it, and he did fix it. And so he drove his schoolmates uh, into school and back again. The teachers weren't too keen on a 14-year-old boy driving around, so they, they didn't really like it. So he used to park around the corner where they couldn't see him. But that's what he used to do, drive his classmates to school and back again in this truck that everybody else had said would never go again, would never work again. And Bill said, no, I, I can fix it. And he did fix it. So that was Bill. And he left school at the age of 15. Not because he was a dropout. Uh, it was partly because he aced all his exams, he did very well. Um, and he, he didn't go to university. Now, that was partly because he was so young. It was mostly because of economic forces that he was only beginning to understand. So the Great Depression had begun with this heart attack of a, of a shock on Wall Street. 
and it was spreading its fingers across the world, even a dairy farm in rural New Zealand wasn't immune from these economic forces. And the price of milk was collapsing, and suddenly Bill's family were in financial trouble, and they certainly couldn't afford for, for Bill to, to go off and, and start studying. They needed him to work, and so that's what he did. He got a job at a uh, hydroelectric dam, power station, and he studied engineering by correspondence course. So these the sort of problems would come, and he'd, he'd read up, and he'd solve the problems, and he'd post them back, and he'd, you know, it was kind of like a, a MOOC, only, you know, in the 1920s, and it's the online learning. Um, and he, he worked, on the, uh, worked on the hydroelectric dam, but New Zealand wasn't quite big enough for Bill. So at first, his itchy feet just expressed themselves in setting up a little business on the side. He set up an open-air cinema. But pretty soon, he decided he wanted to see the world. Now, um, there's a famous Wall Street Journal review of Freakonomics, which says that Steve Levitt is the Indiana Jones of economics. All right. Steve Levitt is not the Indiana Jones of economics. Bill Phillips is the, the Indiana Jones of economics. In between leaving New Zealand and arriving here at the London School of Economics, he was a self-taught busker with a violin, he was a crocodile hunter, gold miner, arrested by the Japanese, accused of spying, rode, rode the Trans-Siberian Express, and all, all sorts of... All sorts of different adventures. And he finally, finally made his way all the way across to the other side of the world, here to London. And he signed up to study engineering at the London School of Economics. And also he signed up for the Royal Air Force. And war immediately broke out in the Far East and he was sent all the way back again to Singapore, to participate in the defense of Singapore. But Bill was still this engineering enthusiast. He's still finding problems, understanding how things work, and, and fixing things. So the, the first problem he, he addressed himself to was the fact that the British Army at the time, these terrible, terrible old planes, completely out of date. Now, Bill had heard that in Europe, modern aeroplanes had machine guns slung under the wings that fired through the propellers. Can you believe it? The propeller would, would be synchronized with the machine gun, and so you could fire through the, machine, through the propeller, uh, and obviously it was much more militarily effective than, say, hitting your own propeller, or, alternatively, much more effective than not having a machine gun at all. So Bill thought, well, that's, that must be a problem I can solve. And so he took these terrible old planes, and he, and he figured out how the whole mechanism worked, and he rigged up these, these 1920s planes to, to be able to fly around with the machine guns synchronized with the propellers. And this, it turns out, wasn't enough to prevent Singapore falling to the oncoming Japanese army. And so Bill Phillips was then named armaments officer on a ship called the Empire Star, uh, which was the last ship evacuating <coughs> refugees from Singapore. Just looking around, is anybody here old enough to remember the A-Team? <laughs> yes, few people. Yes. Look it up on YouTube, guys. It's <laughs> so the A-Team was this... Um, American TV show used to be on on a Saturday afternoon about half past five, and I used to watch it every, every Saturday afternoon, and the plot was always the same. Uh, always the same. I didn't really know. My brain was only half grown, you see. I didn't realise how rubbish it was. There's always, there's always this moment in the A-team where... So the A-team would, would come in, and they were like the, sort of like Robin Hood, and they would, they would beat up the bad guys and help out whoever it was who needed helping, and then the bad, uh, bad guys would come back with reinforcements. And then we're, we're coming up to the second ad break in the, in the hour. And the A-team are in desperate, desperate trouble. And, and how are they going to get out of it? And always what would happen is they would retreat into a garage of some sort. And out of toothpaste and snot, they would construct a tank. <laughs> it wasn't always a tank. I mean, sometimes there was, it was just flamethrowers, and sometimes it was like a light aeroplane or something. But usually it was a tank. And they'd come out of the garage with a tank, and they'd defeat the bad guys, and that would be great. And, uh, you know, I was surprised every time. Every time. <laughs> so Bill Phillips had these, these 18 moments in his career. And the Empire Star was, was really the first one of them. So the Empire Star was a cargo ship. It was designed to hold um, five passengers. There were 2,000 women and children on it when the Japanese Air Force found it 
and began to dive bomb it. And so everybody on board the ship who could lay hold of weapons was standing on deck trying to fight these uh, Japanese planes off. Uh, but what you really needed was a machine gun. And the trouble is, a machine gun really needs a machine gun stand. And they had a machine gun, but they didn't have a machine gun stand. At least they didn't begin the voyage with a machine gun stand. But as the Japanese planes started coming in, Bill Phillips disappeared below deck, had this little 18 moment, then came back up with this improvised machine gun stand and stood on the deck fighting off the Japanese Air Force, um, with the, the bombs raining down all around him. And there are all these eyewitness accounts of, of this um, just amazing sights of this improvised machine gun stand and this New Zealand engineer who re didn't really sign up for this fighting off the Japanese Air Force for hours. And he later got the MBE, which at the time was a medal for bravery. That was all great. He still ended up in a prisoner of war camp. And the, the 18 sort of improvisations continued. So one of the things he made was a, a little immersion heater. You could use it, you could dip it into a, a cup of water and you could boil the water so you could make a morale-boosting cup of tea. And Bill made so many of these that in the prison camp, every evening, the Japanese guards would be there and suddenly the lights would slowly dim. <laughs> look around. I couldn't work out. Why was it every night the lights went dim? It was Bill Phillips making 2,000 cups of tea. That's why the lights had gone dim. And the other thing he made was, was radios, just like his father had taught him. So this is way before the, the, the iPod, or it's way before the Sony Walkman, for, for that matter, making these miniaturized radios in a prisoner of war camp. He made one that was, was underneath the floorboard, and you, would, you could operate it with a bicycle spoke and a straightened coat hanger. And you'd, you'd adjust it and tune it, and you, and you could listen. Um, another one he made, he'd miniaturized to such an extent that he could wear it in the heel of his shoe. There should be in absolutely no doubt, if the radios had been found, he'd have been killed, probably beheaded. So he was taking a tremendous risk, but he really felt the prisoners needed to know what was going on in the world around them. Bill didn't talk very much about his experience uh, in these prison camps. Um, he, he later, sort of in an offhand way, remarked, uh, well, the tall men starved to death, and I was a little guy. Um, one thing he didn't talk about until much later was the, the darkest episode of the war, when he and his fellow prisoners were moved to a different prison camp. They didn't know where it was or what the idea was. But they pretty soon got, got a, a sense of what was planned as they were asked to dig these large mass graves in the middle of the camp. And they could see there were machine guns mounted on the wall of the camp pointing inwards. And so they began to have this conversation about what, what they would do when the machine guns started to fire. Could they, could they get together? Could they pick up stones? If there was a barrage of stones, maybe one of them could escape and report what had happened in the camp. But Bill had his own problem. His problem was the part had gone from his clog radio set. And he'd been separated from the, the underfloor radio set, and he was missing this part. What, what to do? Well, he got together with Lawrence van der Post, the novelist. I'm not making this up. It's really true. He's actually in a Lawrence van der Post book. And he and Lawrence van der Post and a third officer called Donaldson came up with a completely foolproof plan. And this plan was, I think you, when I tell you the plan, you'll agree it's absolutely zero risk. What they were going to do was um, wait until the moon was new, so things were really dark, and then in the middle of the night, they would break into the Japanese camp commander's office. And this is the really brilliant bit. They would take his radio apart and replace the working part from his radio with the faulty part from their radio, and then put it all together so it was working perfectly except for the faulty part. And that would, do you see the brilliance? It would be the gift that kept on giving because the Japanese would switch the radio on and it wouldn't work and then they'd figure out the faulty part and then they'd order a spare in. So that if Bill's radio ever broke again, you see, he's thinking long term for a man in a death camp. <laughs> so, you know, they, they, they did this and it's all, it's all in Lawrence van der Post's book, actually, and, and they got away with it. Donaldson was the one who actually went in and took the radio apart and got the got the, uh, the replacement part, and they got away with their lives. They weren't tortured to death. They weren't beheaded. They made it. And Bill fixed his radio and plugged in the, the earphones, and the first thing he heard was 
that the Americans had dropped an at atomic bomb on Hiroshima and the war was about to be over and they were going to come home. But of course, Bill didn't go home for long. He came back here to the LSE. How could you stay away for long? <laughs> and he decided he didn't want to study uh, engineering. He wanted to study sociology. He wanted to understand how it was that people could be so terrible to each other. And he took a few economics modules on the side. And he wasn't really very impressed with sociology, to be honest. Any sociologist in the room, I apologize. But Bill found it didn't really explain the, the causes and consequences of the Second World War. And um, he wasn't really very impressed with economics either. It, it, seemed, it seemed a little bit odd, a bit clunky. But there was one thing he noticed. Now, Savannah, have you ever noticed macroeconomists, and indeed microeconomists, they, they do love their differential equations. Right? <laughs> love their differential equations. And this was true even in 1949. So Bill was sort of sitting through all these lectures and solving these problem sets, and they were full of differential equations. And um, this hasn't changed at all. <laughs> and he, he recognised the differential equations. He said to himself, well, actually, I've solved these differential equations before. When I was doing my correspondence course, and when I was working on the hydroelectric dam, actually these equations could equally describe the flow of a liquid around a system. All the rates of change and all of that, they're absolutely familiar to me. And so he went to James Mead. And he said to Mead, who later won the Nobel Prize in economics, he said, well, um, I've got an idea. I think that I should rewrite all of your economic models, rework all your economic models, as a study in plumbing. <laughs> so Mead, you've got to remember, Bill is failing his exams at this point. So the, the, I mean, you try that, if you're failing your exams, you try this on your economics <laughs> professor, see where it gets you. <laughs> but Mead, I think, to his enormous credit, said, well, OK, that sounds interesting. Go and give it a go. And so another 18 moment, Bill Phillips retreats to another garage this time in Croydon, with an economist who's a year older than him, a guy called Walter Newlin, and together they build a machine. And it's this machine that Bill Phillips unveils at, at the Lionel Robbins seminar at the end of 1949. So remember, all of these professors are there, they're all ready to sort of giggle a bit at whatever crazy thing this New Zealander has come up with. Bill Phillips himself, it's his last chance. He's had the mother of all gap years. But academia <laughs> is not working out for him. This is it. If, he, if it doesn't work, he's going to go back to some you know, everyday job as an engineer or, or maybe as a farmer. And that's not what he wants. So as the seminar begins, he, he unveils this thing. And it's about, it's about the size of, a, of an American-style fridge. That's sort of so big. And it looks, like, it looks a bit like a hamster gym, only for goldfish that makes any sense. There were all of these, these little um, perspex containers filled with water. The water's been, been stained pink with dye to make it easier to follow. And they're connected by sluice gates and dams and pumps and valves and pipes. And they've got these little labels on them. So consumption, investment, royal mint, imports, exports, uh, government taxation. And there's a big tank at the bottom that says national income. And Bill reaches around the back of this machine and he turns it on. And so there's this whir of a sort of Moulinex blender going. It's actually a fuel pump he scavenged from a Lancaster bomber. In fact, the entire thing is scavenged from Lancaster bomber scrap. Even the perspex has come from Lancaster bomber windows. And Bill never, never missed an opportunity to put to use the lessons he'd learned. And he began to explain to all of these great colleagues of his at the London School of Economics what he'd done. He built a computer. A hydraulic, a hydraulic computer, the first ever computer model of the British economy, in fact, the first ever computer model, proper computer model, of any economy anywhere in the world. And the hydraulic flows moved around levers and floats, and they, in turn, moved pens, and the pens were on rolling systems of paper, a little bit like seismographs, and they would record economic fluctuations. And you could adjust interest rates, or you could... Uh, put more imports into the system or take more exports out of the system or raise taxes or lower taxes and you could see how GDP would respond. 
And within five minutes, all the talk in LSE had turned to how on earth they could get this failing sociology student a professorship immediately. <laughs> we'll come back to Bill Phillips later. But the reason I found the Phillips machine such an important uh, symbol in economics, really, because I think it is a symbol, is because macroeconomics is a system. So when I wrote The Undercover Economist, this is the sequel to The Undercover Economist, of course, that's why it's called The Undercover Economist Strikes Back, because what is the most awesome sequel in history? You know, I'm just saying. <laughs> Even better than the original, just saying. Now, <laughs> with, with microeconomics, you can point to individual things. You can say, look, this is what um, prices look like when you go into Costa Coffee, and here's why they look the way they look. Uh, with, with behavioral economics, you can point to these clever things, and these, or not so clever things, that people do in laboratories. But with macroeconomics, what do you point to? The whole point of macroeconomics is that it is a system. It all fits together. And that was, that was really uh, Keynes's contribution was, was to introduce this systemic thinking, the, the, the idea that rather than looking at all the, the individual parts, you had to look at the whole, and you had to look at ways that the whole could malfunction. And that's, I think, what's unique about the macroeconomist's way of, of looking at how things work. And that, it's tricky because you, you can't easily point to a system and say, look, there's a system, that's how the system works. The moment you point to any particular part of it, anything specific, there's always something that you're missing, something uh, behind your back. There's a very famous essay by Frederick Bastiat called What is Not Seen? Bastiat and Keynes are not often regarded as intellectual bedfellows. Keynes is regarded as being very interventionist. Bastiat regarded as being very libertarian. But fundamentally, they were making a similar point when they said that your, your common sense will let you down. When you point at a specific thing and say that's what's going on, you are missing all of the interconnections, all of the other things that are going on in the system. So that's why I started with Bill Phillips and the Phillips machine, because Bill Phillips was trying to understand the system as a whole, and he was trying to give us a picture of the system as a whole. Now, was the Phillips machine a good picture of an economy? Well, it's pretty good for 1949. I'm not sure it's such a good picture today. Um, but merely the attempt to see the economy working as a whole is very important. Now, when I was working uh, on the book, I, I needed to find systems that I could talk about, that I could write about, that were complex enough, systemic enough, if you like, that you could, you could actually see recognizable economic phenomena going on inside them, and yet at the same time they needed to be simple enough that you could describe them uh, with words rather than with 58 differential equations to be solved simultaneously, or even 158 or 558. So I was looking for good examples of systems, and I, and I found two that I want to talk to you about uh, this evening. One is, one is quite famous. One um, was, was described in um, the Journal of Money, Credit and Banking in the late 1970s, but it was made famous by Paul Krugman. The other is much less famous, but I think it's just as interesting. And they tell us different stories. So the first example, the first system I want to talk about is um, a recession that was created entirely on Capitol Hill, which is very unusual. I mean, Capitol Hill doesn't usually specialize in creating recessions. Um, <laughs> but in this particular case, it was, it was a teensy tiny recession. And the lawyers who created the recession on Capitol Hill weren't working for Congress. Well, actually, a lot of them were working for Congress. But in their spare time, they were mums and dads. And they worked for a babysitting <laughs> cooperative. It was quite a big babysitting cooperative. There were about 300, 400 people in it, about the same number as there are people in this room. And the way it would work is you would, uh, you would go out, you'd have dinner, see a show, something, and you'd need your children to be looked after. So somebody else from the babysitting cooperative would look after your children. And then later, you would uh, stay in and look after someone else's children, and you'd repay your debt. Well, how do you keep track of, of all those mutual interdependencies. You could just have a spreadsheet. It just keeps track of everything. Um, these days, that might be possible. 1979, not very easy. We don't really have the computing power. And so instead of the spreadsheet, instead of some centralized database keeping track of who has babysat for whom, 
Instead, you use a currency or a pseudo-currency, a kind of script. So you have these babysitting coupons. And these babysitting coupons were worth half an hour of peak time babysitting. And people had 20 of them. Joined up babysitting co-op, were given 20 babysitting co-op tokens. Okay, so that's 10 hours of peak time babysitting. When you think about it, 10 hours. I and mean, that's really only one really good night. <laughs> so maybe it's not enough. And so what people did was they said, well, um, we're not going to go out to babysit straight away. We're going to stay in and we'll babysit for somebody else. And we'll earn some more babysitting coupons. And then we, when we've got enough babysitting coupons to really feel we've got plenty, uh, we'll be willing to go out. OK, well, that's what the people who had newly joined the babysitting co-op thought. What about the people who were already in the babysitting co-op? Well, it turns out that due to some ad administrative glitch, which is not very interesting, they actually had, on average, fewer than 10 hours of babysitting. So the people coming in didn't have enough. The people who were already in didn't have enough. Everybody wanted somebody else to go out so they could babysit for them. And so, of course, nobody went out. And the, the co-op even decided to in, institute uh, administrative measures, to institute, pass a, a kind of law um, to get people to go out. They said, there's a rule. You have to go out twice a year. <laughs> twice a year. But this is supposed to be a binding constraint that will really kickstart the economy. It just goes to show you, the economy was in a depression. It really was in a depression. If, if, if going out twice a year is supposed to be some kind of impetus to, to really sort of kickstart your social life, you know that there's a depression going on. And when you think about it, it, it's an interesting kind of depression because there were hundreds of people perfectly willing to babysit. So the supply was there. And there were hundreds of people who, in principle, were interested in having people babysit for them. So the potential demand was there. But somehow, the supply and demand didn't find a way to, to equilibrate. They, they didn't match up. What was going on? Well, there are different ways to look at this. Uh, one way to look at this is to simply to say, the problem was prices did not adjust. I mean, you could have gone to somebody and said, look, I, I really want to babysit. And I'm willing to babysit for um, three hours, not for, not for six tokens, but I, I will do it just, just for, for five tokens or for three tokens. I'll, I'll cut my price. I'm, I'm just desperate to get a few more tokens in. Prices could have adjusted, and in principle, that would have worked just fine. But prices stubbornly stuck. There was no rational microeconomic reason why prices would stick. There were plenty of behavioral reasons why you might expect prices to stick, psychological reasons why you might expect prices to stick. Um, the problem was solved. And it wasn't solved by prices adjusting. The problem was solved when the babysitting co-op committee decided that what they really needed to do was to print some more money. Quantitative easing. That's what you need. And so they created more babysitting tokens, and they handed them out, and they gave, they gave people more babysitting tokens when they joined. And um, actually, they re didn't require all of them to be paid back. Hopefully, the Treasury is sort of going to get the same treatment from the Bank of England. But, um, so suddenly, there was much more money around. And you might think, well, well, that should solve the problem. More money should solve the problem. And it did solve the problem. It's not at all clear, though, that more money should solve the problem. It's actually a bit of a puzzle. You think about it, the demand was there, the supply was there. The money should be just a little bit of lubricant. Turns out the money was absolutely fundamental, and that, that's a key insight in macroeconomics that does not emerge from looking at microeconomics. Now, um, Paul Krugman loves to tell the story, and, and I like the story as well. One of the reasons Paul Krugman likes to tell the story is because uh, it uh, expresses his faith that sometimes the government can intervene and, and kick-start things when, when they're going wrong. Um, he even cites Keynes. So Keynes, um, we talked about Bill Phillips fixing the truck. Keynes has this famous um, metaphor where he says the, the economy is suffering from magneto trouble. A magneto is a kind of alternator in your car. It's basically it's a little part. The car doesn't go if the magneto's broken. But all you need to do is fix the magneto, and then the car will go. So Keynes said the, the economy is like that. You just need to fix, fix this small technical thing, and then everything will be fine. You don't need to have a great long depression. 
you know, excesses do not need to be purged. Just need to fix the problem and get on with it, okay? And, uh, and I think Paul's right to emphasize this. This is an important insight into economics. He has, I have to say, and I hesitate to criticize Paul because I think he's right about a lot of things. He has underplayed how the story ended. You want to know how the story ended? They printed too much money. There was a massive inflationary boom when the economy collapsed. <laughs> Just saying. Um, now, it doesn't mean that all intervention is doomed, but it does mean sometimes it's a little trickier than the pundits will have us believe. Now, I, I love the story of the babysitting co-op because it is a, a great example of what you might call a Keynesian recession. And let me be really loose about how I describe a Keynesian recession. What I mean by a Keynesian recession is a Keynesian recession is one where it's all there. All the pieces of the economy are there. Everything seems to be ready to work, and yet somehow there's something wrong with the internal workings of the economy, and it needs external influence. It needs the government to step in and to give it a kickstart. And in this case, monetary policy. And Keynes believed that monetary policy would often work fine. Um, sometimes you need fiscal policy instead. That's a very interesting and useful system to talk about. There are economists who see things differently. And so I want to also talk to you about this other system that I discovered, which I think is equally interesting. And this is a World War II prison camp. Um, I know I, there's a World War II prison camp, you know, excess supply of World War II prison camps in this talk probably, but um, it's a totally different one. Bill Phillips wasn't there. Um, it was in Germany, not in, uh, not in Java. And one of the prisoners of war was a man called Robert Radford. And Robert Radford had studied economics at Cambridge. Um, an undergraduate who presumably got to see John Maynard Keynes himself lecturing. And then he was in the war, he was taken prisoner, he spent years in a prisoner of war camp. At the end of the war he was released and he went on to join the newly founded uh, International Monetary Fund and he spent his whole life working as an economist for the IMF. But in between working at the IMF and being in a prisoner of war camp, he wrote this short and rather beautiful article called The Economic Organization of a POW Camp. And he described how this POW camp had an economy, it worked in interesting ways, and I think it worked in ways that give us broader lessons. So you, you might think, well, how can a prisoner of war camp had, have an economy? Uh, well, basically it has an economy because people have different wants. There's a little bit of production in the economy. People would sort of stitch on buttons and shine shoes and there was one guy who made tea and coffee. He even had an accountant working for him. Um, but mostly people were trading because food parcels would arrive from the Red Cross. They had cigarettes, medicines, shaving stuff, and, and food. And some people uh, smoked and some people didn't smoke. Some people really wanted to shave. Other people didn't mind growing a beard. Um, the, um, the Indians in the camp generally weren't that interested in the corned beef. They wanted to trade that away. Um, the French really wanted the coffee. The English wanted the tea. Different people wanted different things, and so they traded. And there was quite a sophisticated system for trading. There were arbitrage constraints that were satisfied. There was a futures market. You could trade bread today or bread tomorrow. Bread tomorrow was well, a different commodity to bread today. And one of the interesting things that um, Robert Radford noticed was there was, this, there was this idea of the just price out there. So prices were, people had this sense of what prices should be. I remember that was, that was absolutely the, the, the death knell for the babysitting co-op. People had this strange idea, which has no basis whatsoever in, in uh, rational economic um, behavior, a strange idea that just because a token says 30 minutes of babysitting, it's actually worth 30 minutes of babysitting. And people really stuck to it. They really believed that it must be 30 minutes. We can't haggle on that. Well, there was the same idea in the prisoner of war camp. There was a sense of, well, this is how many cigarettes this loaf of bread is worth. Um, this is how, how many cigarettes a, a can of corned beef is worth. But although people had this moral sense, and although the senior British officer in the camp desperately tried to enforce these fair prices, and well, what is a fair price? Well, basically, it's whatever price people got used to. That's therefore the fair price. But the fair prices really had no purchase in the economy as a whole. Robert Radford um, comments that the actual prices at which goods were exchanged fluctuated up and down in line with supply and demand and showed absolutely no adherence to any ethical theory of prices whatsoever. So this is very interesting. This is a very different 
economy from the babysitting co-op because actually prices are extremely flexible. And no matter who wanted the loaf of bread or no matter who wanted the hunk of cheese or no matter who wanted the pack of coffee, it would get there. It would get to the highest bidder. No matter how much the authorities tried to regulate prices and stop them moving, they did move. At one stage, the prisoner of war camp was even exporting coffee to Germany. <laughs> In Germany, the war was going very badly for the Germans. They really wanted coffee. The prisoners had coffee. Therefore, over the wire it went. There were people who were able to make that transaction. There were gains from trade. They were realized. So that was an economy that worked extremely well. And that's, that's way out of line with the, the Keynesian vision of, of economic systems. That's much more what we might call the classical view of an economic system, where everything, it's all smooth, everyone's rational, it all works. Supply equals demand, the economy works. And there's only one problem with this very smoothly working economy. The prisoners almost all died. They almost all starved to death. You might say, well, how could they starve to death if the economy was working so well? Well, very simple. The food parcels from the Red Cross stopped turning up. And if there's no food, it doesn't matter how well your economy is working, you're in trouble. And so the, the, the exchange rate of food for cigarettes changed and changed and changed and changed until eventually there was no food left. And then just as people were absolutely desperate, as pri just as prices seemed to be evaporating, there was no economy at all, uh, the US Army turned up and demonstrated that in, in uh, certain circumstances, all wants can be satisfied as they handed out food to these starving, starving men. Um, so what's going on? The economy worked so well, it malfunctioned. Well, of course, that's a prisoner of war camp. What does that tell us about the real economy? Well, actually, that's a story that tells us a great deal about the way the classical vision in economics works. The classical vision in economics says the economy works fine, supply adjusts to meet demand, um, you, can't just, you can't have a generalized shortage of demand, prices will adjust. Um, of course, you can have recessions. It would, only an idiot would say you can't have recessions. We see recessions you know, all around us in the world. We go through recessions every decade or so. Um, but the recessions aren't faults with the economy. The recessions are things hitting the economy from the outside, most likely to be some kind of technological shock. So somebody invents something new and cool, like the cell phone or fracking. I don't know how cool you think fracking is, but it's certainly new, and it's certainly making a big difference. Um, or um, you know, somebody declares war in the Middle East, and suddenly the price of oil goes up. That's another kind of shock. And the growth of China is a shock to Europe. And some of these shocks are positive, some of them are negative, but they, they create all kinds of fluctuations. And it doesn't matter how well your economy is working, it will still fluctuate. It will still suffer recessions. So that's the classical vision of, of how the economic system works. It's like the prisoner of war camp. And the important thing is, if that's the way you see the economy, you do not want the Bank of England messing around. You do not want Ed Balls to be chancellor and spending lots of money. That's not going to help. They're, they're, just, they're just acting like the senior British officer in the prisoner of war camp. They're trying to regulate things. They're trying to fix the system. They can't possibly make it better. They may well make it worse. And that's the classical vision of recessions. Actually, a lot of the book, which I do recommend that you buy, <laughs> a lot of the book is about this tension as to how much we should see recessions through the babysitting co-op lens, the Keynesian lens, that says they are internal malfunctions with the economy, and the economy can be helped. And how much we see the economy is working very smoothly, and the recessions are just these impersonal forces. They hit it from the outside. There's nothing that you can do. just need to hold on, and things will come good in the end. Um, George Osborne sees the economy like a prisoner of war camp. Ed Balls sees the economy like the babysitting co-op. Um, I have my own views. But one of the things I wanted to do in the book was to lay it all out so that people could come to their own conclusions rather than just being told by some pundit what to think, to actually say, what is this argument about? Why are economists disagreeing? What's the evidence? What conclusion should I come to myself? But I will tell you one thing that I, I've come to, one conclusion I've come to over the course of writing the book. 
It's that there's something of the Bill Phillips spirit has gone missing in macroeconomics. Uh, uh, and I really want to get it back. Bill was a man who looked at a recession the same way he looked at that broken down old car, the truck that his neighbour had abandoned. He saw see something that everybody else says, there's nothing we can do. It's too complex. We can't understand it. There's nothing we can do to fix it. And Bill said, no, no, there is something we can do to understand it. And if we can understand it, then we can fix it. And he did. I'm happy to take questions, but thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Tim. So let's take questions, short questions, um, in groups of three. And just an announcement for those of you who have to leave earlier, um, uh, Tim's books are on sale outside of the old theatre. And there are, there are some signed copies available, excellent Christmas presents. And by the way, <laughs> just sorry to interrupt, but the books are on sale from my, my old local bookshop, Pages of Hackney. So they are, they are a small, independent retailer, they pay their taxes, and I think it's a splendid opportunity to support them, uh, as well as getting a perfect Christmas present. <laughs> there we go. I am an economist. <laughs> So please raise your hands. Um, do we have one here? One in the back. There's a microphone just coming to you, sir. So just talking about Bill Phillips, do you believe that there's um, much relevance nowadays for his very mechanical style modelling of the economy? Or do you believe we should be looking for more, like um, looking at very psychological ways of analysing instead of using purely mathematical models? Was someone else up there? Yep. Um, first of all, I enjoy your speech very much. The, um, at the beginning, you said that the study of economics has started after the Depression, which was the 30s, so some 70 or 80 years ago. Since then, a rather a lot of intellectual and financial capital has been expended in studying economics but I still observe a lot of disagreement between professional economists about policy prescriptions of many sorts. Are we making any progress? Yeah, the gentleman in the back. Um, Tim, you mentioned there's a midway between following the baby's sitting uh, way and the jail way. What would that way be, and how could we implement that in the current scenario? Thank cool. Would you well, like to take those three? Yeah, years? those are those are actually really fantastically relevant questions that I answer at some length in the book. So thank you for asking them rather than weird offbeat questions. Um, so, in terms of the middle way, uh, analytically, uh, in modern macroeconomics does offer us. Uh, 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 a, a synthesis of the Keynesian and the classical view. That's, that's too technical for my book. I, I didn't want to write a book with any maths in. I wanted to write a book that people who knew nothing about macroeconomics could pick up and understand where the debates were. But that's, I mean, at the cutting edge of macro, that, that is a, a compromise um, that I think is potentially very fruitful. It doesn't seem to have um, affected the thinking of uh, politicians very much. So I think it's still relevant to talk about the the Keynesian versus the classicals. Um, another way to, uh, to combine the two is to say, well, a lot of economists believe that the Keynesian view applies in the short run. You can argue about how long the short run is. And the classical view is more appropriate in the long run. Um, so uh, George Osborne took a classical view of the economy. You could, you could argue uh, he was wrong and wrong and wrong and wrong and wrong. And then eventually the long run arrived and he eventually became right. But that doesn't mean he hasn't been wrong for years. So that's, that's another middle way. And um, also, ju just in terms of policy, there are some things. I don't want to go through all the bullet points that I uh, cover in the book. But there are ways that I think we should think about dealing with recessions, preparing for recessions, acting during recessions, uh, monetary and fiscal policy that I think should satisfy both sides. It's just we, we have tended to do a bad job of preparing ourselves 
uh, before the recession hits. Um, in terms of whether macroeconomics has, has made much progress, um, yes, I think it has, um, but I think it's still a deeply uh, troubled subject. And I'm a microeconomist, I'm not a macroeconomist. Uh, so writing the book just gave me a sense of um, why macroeconomists sometimes do the crazy things that they do. Um, but the truth is, it is a tremendously difficult job. Keynes had this, this uh, beautiful paragraph. It was sort of supposed to be about Marshall, but really I think Keynes was writing about himself when he wrote about what the perfect economist would be like. And he described how he had to be, it's all he, I'm afraid. Sorry, Silvano, it's all he. Um, but he had to um, be a diplomat, and yet he needed to be able to grasp earthy disciplines. He needed to be able to speak the beautiful prose, but also mathematics, to have a sense of history, but also to see into the future. And you, and you actually you see the, all the different disciplines that would go into understanding the economy, the macroeconomy, with 10 billion different products and 7 billion people. And you realize it is a genuinely difficult job. Um, the reason why we haven't made a massive amount of progress isn't just because macroeconomists is silly. It's hard. It's genuinely hard. And we have made progress. Um, but let me, let me go on to, the, to the, the final question, which was about whether Bill Phillips' views are relevant today. Actually, I think there's a very sad story about, about Bill. And he's actually most famous for nothing that I mentioned in the lecture today. He's most famous for the Phillips curve. Which I'm sure any of you who have even a passing familiarity with economics will have heard about the Phillips curve. It's one of the most fundamental ideas in macroeconomics. There's a statistical correlation between inflation and un unemployment. Um, Bill phrased it slightly differently, but it's become known now as inflation unemployment trade-off. And um, he presented, he did this work, and he found this correlation. And he didn't really think that was anything terribly exciting. He just said, look, it's just a correlation. Um, he said it was a rushed job. But remember, his colleagues were desperately trying to get this young man with no track record, hadn't even passed many exams. They were trying to get him a professorship. And so they needed a publication record. Even in the 1950s, you needed a publication record. And so they urged him to publish this piece. And there's some evidence they may even have published it without him really giving his permission. And um, it became the most widely cited paper in the history of macroeconomics. It's the most famous thing any macroeconomist has ever done. And he thought it was a rush job. And he didn't really believe it. Other economists took hold of the Phillips curve. And they said, look, this is like a, a menu of choices. You can, um, you can choose where you want to be, whether you want to be you know, high unemployment and low inflation, or you want higher inflation but lower unemployment. And uh, this was pushed quite hard by several of Bill's colleagues. And it doesn't seem that Bill really ever believed it. And, if, and the, the Phillips curve came under attack from the likes of Robert Lucas and Milton Friedman. And their argument was, you've got to think about the microeconomic foundations of this. Um, you've got to think about what people, what, what are people actually doing when they agree to take jobs for, uh, because the money, price, the money wage is going up. I mean, they're just being completely fooled. They're, only, they're not really being paid more. They're just being fooled by inflation. And they'll, they'll, they'll get ahead of this idea. They'll, they'll understand this is what's going on. They won't be fooled at all after a while. And Friedman set this out. Ned Phelps set this out. Robert Lucas set this out. They all got Nobel Prizes. And as they were making this case, shortly after they made this case, the oil shock hit in the 1970s, and the Phillips curve relationship completely collapsed. So there was this theoretical attack, and there was this empirical attack. And the whole thing was suddenly completely discredited. And it set back Keynesian economics a long way, and really established the reputation of the, the new classical economists. Bill Phillips never bought it at all. So he had this thing attached to his, with, with his name on it, this incredibly famous contribution. He never. He never rated it. Bill Phillips was far more interested in two things. Uh, one was economic dynamics, much more sophisticated than the hydraulic macro he'd been working on. And economists still struggle with this today. But so the sort of thing we're talking about is, you know, the, the Millennium Bridge. Remember the Millennium Bridge, which, used, which wobbled, they put it up, and then it wobbled from side to side like a slinky as people walked on it. And that turned out to be a very complex and unpredictable interaction between the people would wobble the bridge a little bit, and then the bridge would wobble, and then the people would react to that, and that would exaggerate the wobble, and it would get bigger and bigger and bigger, and you get this horrible dynamic, and the bridge had to be closed down and, and fixed. And Bill Phillips was fascinated with that kind of stuff. And interestingly, 
the engineer, Alan McRobbie at Cambridge, who under finally understood what was going on with the Millennium Bridge, is also the man who rebuilt the Phillips machine. So there's now a working Phillips machine in Cambridge, built by the same guy who's fascinated by the Millennium Bridge. So Bill Phillips was fascinated by, I think, far more than this purely hydraulic macro. He was also fascinated by China. He, he left London and he went to Auckland in the early 1970s, having agreed that he was going to spend half of his time studying China. Now, China was nothing in the 1970s. They had nuclear weapons, but there was zero economy. But Bill Phillips thought there was something there. He was fascinated by China. He taught himself to speak Chinese in the prison camps. And he, he wanted to study China because he thought China was the future. So yeah, the crude ideas to which Bill Phillips' name have been attached, um, no, I think they're reasonably well discredited. What Bill Phillips actually believed, I think, remains relevant today. The sad thing is, before he could get involved in defending himself against Friedman and Lucas and the others, he died very young. He had a stroke in his early 60s. And so we'll never know what he would have thought or what he would have made of it. Thank you. One more question in the back. Hello, Tim. I thought it was a great story about Bill Phillips. In, in your book, you're, you're quite dismissive of um, the whole hack, happy-nomics movement. And um, I just wondered, in terms of um, the period that you were talking about, I don't think national income accounting had been completely accepted because it started in 1934. It wasn't accepted by all countries till um, the late 50s. And so the period that you're talking about, they were trying to work out something that hadn't really been fully worked out at that point. I think one of the things that Simon Kuznets did was to change economics from an um, ideologically riven, um, a messy social science into something that was accepted by everyone. Do you not think that that's possibly what's ha going on today with the kind of happiness, happynomics type stuff, type of stuff that Daniel Kahneman's working on? And that the Bill Phillips of today would be working on how we can work out how to bring measurements of happiness and well-being into our definitions of progress. And the last question here. Hi. Um, you mentioned microeconomic foundations. Just wondering if you give your view on a kind of trade-off. I mean, microeconomic foundations obviously provide an analytical framework for modern macroeconomics and perhaps a more convenient analytical framework at that. But when you mentioned that macroeconomics is obviously so different to micro, when you look at things like aggregate aggregation and things like herd behavior, do you think the trade-off's worth it using micro foundations to study macroeconomics? Sure, thanks for, for the questions. Um, I, I think that we lost our way a little with micro foundations. Uh, when I studied economics, I, I could see the attraction. I thought it was all very cool and very brilliant. And um, the problem is that micro-founded models have just proved very, very, uh, poor at mimicking what's going on in the real world. So just for those who, who have no idea what I'm talking about, um, which hopefully is very few of you, but some of you may not have started your course at the LSE yet, or may have wandered in off the street hoping this would be about something other than economics, uh, in which case I'm deeply sorry. So the, um, so the idea is well, micro foundations, there's a, there's a particular set of rules, the, the way economists think about human behavior. And those rules are starting to broaden out and incorporate more psychological realism and so on. But fundamentally, you're thinking about what is it that makes people tick? What is it that people, why are people making the decisions that they make? And what decisions are they making? Faced with particular opportunities to invest, to spend money, um, interest rates, etc., etc. And the micro foundations approach says, to understand the, the economic system, all we need to do is um, seven billion of those people, put them all together, and there you've got the economy. And the more traditional macro just says, it's very appealing, but um, we just can't make it work. It's too complex. You can't model 7 billion people. And so you, you end up modeling, say, one person. You say, just imagine that person, but 7 billion times that. And theoretically appealing as it is, it, it hasn't really worked very well so far. There is a reason why economists sort out this theoretical purity almost at the expense of, of empirical realism. And it was the collapse of the Phillips curve and the theoretical attack on the Phillips curve. That was the reason. We, we'd had this very nice empirical regularity. We didn't really know how it worked, but we could see it was always there. Uh, and then um, Friedman, Phelps, Lucas said, that's not good enough. You have to understand what underpins it. We think it's fragile. 
we think you haven't understood the, the theoretical behavior that underpins it. And then, lo and behold, it completely collapses. And so they absolutely seem vindicated. And at that point, you could, can you see the appeal of somebody who says, we're not going to trust the empirical data. The, the empirical data can always betray us because these relationships are not stable. Instead, let's have a really, really robust microeconomic theoretical underpinning. And only when we've got that, then we'll go back to the empirical data. I totally understand why that looked appealing in 1974. Unfortunately, 30, 40 years later, we still haven't really got anywhere. So I think we probably need to broaden our horizons. Um, in terms of happynomics, I don't quite agree that I am dismissive of happynomics. I am dismissive of um, excessive claims that are made for it. Um, and I'm skeptical about certain proponents who, who've been very, very lazy about the way that they, they bandy the term around. I'm a fan of Daniel Kahneman's work on happiness, and I say so in the book. Um, and I think that is potentially very, very useful. Just to, just to run you through. So the, the way that Daniel Kahneman looks at this, he and Alan Kruger, who's a senior advisor to Barack Obama, um, his approach is to, to take people and say, talk me through yesterday. What did you do? Okay, breakfast. How long did you spend having breakfast? How did you feel? What emotions did you feel while you were having breakfast? Were you with anybody? Then what did you do? Oh, you went to work. Okay, how long did that take? What were the emotions you felt while you were going to work? And, and to really track this, and, and he, he's trying to get more interpersonal comparability. Um, in case you're, you're interested, the thing that we um, dislike most is commuting. The people we like, we dislike spending time with most is our boss. The thing we like doing most is having sex. Um, having sex with your boss wasn't studied by the <laughs> study. By the study. Um, I mean, this is potentially, I'm, I'm being slightly facetious, but this is potentially, is very useful because you could start valuing things such as um, improved traffic flow, infrastructure projects on trains, um, children's playgrounds, all sorts of things you could potentially start to value. And I think that's perfectly useful. Um, what I don't believe is that it's just measure, going out and saying, how happy are you on a scale of 1 to 10, which is what is done a lot, and a lot of this so-called work, work on happiness, basically that, um, that's not going to replace GDP. It's easy to do. We should do it. It tells us something. It doesn't tell us that much. Just imagine if we tried to measure GDP by going around and just saying, how rich are you on a scale of 1 to 10? <laughs> Do you think that people's answers would change over the course of 30 years? I don't. I think people would basically, they'd say, well, there'd be a range of answers, but the average answer would be seven. The average answer is always seven. And 30 years later, people would still say, well, I'm still, you know, I'm kind of, you know, about that rich. Um, would you say, well, there's been no growth. There's been no economic growth at all. People still say seven. And yet, on the basis of the same evidence, we say people aren't getting any happier. And I just don't know how we can even say such a thing. So, um, so yes, I'm, I'm ca I, a cautious welcome to the more sophisticated versions of well-being indicators. They are low cost to collect, they are potentially very helpful, and fundamentally, economics is, is all about people and our experiences, and if we are not happy, if we are, do not feel well-being, then there's no point in anything. Um, just to, I'm gonna conclude by, by my least favorite happynomics story, though. So the... Um, the New Economics Foundation, a few years ago, uh, released a press release saying that Vanuatu uh, had topped their um, Happy Planet Index. And a bunch of media then picked up this press release and said, uh, Vanuatu is the happiest place in the world. And then they started to speculate, why is it that Vanuatu is the happiest place in the world? Is it the booze? Is it the, the sun? The beaches, is it, there's no income tax in Vanuatu, apparently, or something. All these little facts about Vanuatu. Um, if they had read the New Economics Foundation press release a little bit more carefully, they would have found that, actually, they hadn't said Vanuatu is the happiest place on the world. They had multiplied average happiness by life expectancy divided by a measure of the ecological footprint. And, um, and they, they were quite clear that this is what they'd done. And since your lifespan can't really get over, your average lifespan can't really get over 80, and in Vanuatu it was about 70, so they're perfectly healthy. And since your happiness cannot, by definition, get above 10, because it's on a scale of 1 to 10, 
And since the ecological footprint of the typical Vanuatuan was 10 times smaller than the ecological footprint of the typical US citizen, the only way that US citizen could actually become as happy, happy planetish as the average Vanuatuan would be to, for their entire lives, to be orgasmically blissful <laughs> and to live to the age of 460. Um, or alternatively, they could pollute less, they could cut their ecological footprint, which is fine, I've got no objection to that, but maybe they should just have said, you know what, Americans should consume a bit less, less CO2, that would be handy. But of course they didn't get any press release. So you've got all this nonsense published about how Vanuatu is the happiest place on the world and why it's the happiest place in the world. And one more thing. <laughs> Nobody ever actually went to Vanuatu <laughs> and asked them how happy they were. <laughs> it's too small. So they just extrapolated it by looking at similar nations. <laughs> so, so no, I am not dismissive of all happynomics, but there are certain bits of happynomics I would happily see dismissed. <laughs> Thank you everyone again, and Tim in particular.